Hello and welcome to Quarantini Day 12. I'm Dr. Eric Servini. We have some exciting news today, including an announcement of our April book selection. Brand new, first time announcement, so stay tuned. But first, a sip of history for you guys. Today is April 2nd, and exactly 46 years ago, on April 2nd, 1974, a 21-year-old woman named Kathy Kozachenko was elected to the Ann Arbor City Council in Michigan. And you may ask, why is that so important? Well, she was openly gay, making her the first openly LGBTQ plus American to be elected to public office. So a lot of people assume that this feat belongs to Harvey Milk in San Francisco. You may have seen the wonderful film about him. But Kozachenko was actually elected over three full years before him. And maybe you would assume that to win as a gay person, especially in 1974, you would have to run a really respectable, middle-of-the-road, semi-conservative campaign. But what policies did Kozachenko propose? Well, first, she proposed that we eliminate the penalty for the possession of marijuana. And second, she proposed a rent control measure that placed a limit on the amount of profit that landlords could make. So, sounds pretty great and revolutionary, huh? And the best part is she actually won. So, tonight, raise a glass to Kathy Kozichenko. And thank you to Sarah Prager, The Quist App, and Lillian Faderman, the author of the book, The Gay Revolution, for all of your wonderful information uh, about Kathy and her incredible story. So, our exciting news. My friend Jordan, or Jordy's book club on Instagram, recently told me about a book that was just released last month in March. And I have to say, as an author myself, and with the current news cycle, other authors, novelists, anyone with new books right now are really struggling, really going up against this virus and this news cycle. So I really want to help them out. And since Giovanni's room was a bit intense, not to mention the stressful world that we're living in now, I wanted to find something that was a bit more optimistic, escapist, and hopeful. Um, And so I am extremely thrilled to announce that the Quarantini April selection is... uh Uh-oh. It's on my Kindle, but it just turned off. It's Under the Rainbow by Celia Lasky. Um, She describes herself as a very gay author on Twitter, and the story is incredible. Here it is. Here's the cover. On my my Kindle, it's a story about a group of uh, LGBTQ plus volunteers who travel to the most homophobic small town in the country, hoping to change hearts and minds. And I'll be honest, I was a bit skeptical skeptical about the story when I first heard about it, but then I read the book. It is incredibly well-written, it's very moving, and especially now, it's very inspiring. Uh, The cast of characters is very diverse, and as the publisher describes the book, it's told with warmth and wit, and it's a poignant, hopeful articulation of our complicated humanity that reminds us we are more alike than we'd like to admit. So something I think we absolutely need right now. The New York Times said it feels fresh and thus essential. So brand new book. We're going to be supporting a a brand new author uh, this month. And most importantly, the story itself is a story of hope and humanity, which, like I said, I think we can all use right now. So the big question, how do you actually get the book? Well, Amazon is currently advertising, unfortunately, that it will take three full weeks to deliver the book. So that raises some other great options that are not Amazon. So number one, and the the highest suggestion, if you can afford it, buy the book from bookshop.org, which gives a large percentage of its profits to independent bookshops. And as you know, independent shops are really struggling right now, and it is absolutely essential. Uh, And I'm biased because I'm an author, but it is so important that we have these physical spaces where communities, where authors, where books and readers can come together and and have a space that is their own. And so this is a way you can very easily support these independent spaces. Plus, bookshop.org has very fast shipping. So you can find a link 
to the book at our site at quarantini.lgbt. So option number two, if you have a Kindle, you can get it immediately. Uh, it's like 14 bucks. Pretty easy to do. Um, you can also read it on your computer if you have that. And then third is you can get an audiobook for eight bucks or for free if you have not used Audible before. You can sign up for a trial. Just don't forget to cancel after a month. And then a bonus option, Jordy's Book Club on Instagram is giving away five digital copies for free to anyone who participates on his contest on Instagram. He's a great friend. Check out his page, Jordy's Book Club. And uh, maybe you'll win and maybe you uh, won't have to worry about uh, buying it anywhere else. So I will assign the first chapter of the book, uh, not until this upcoming Monday. So you have time to decide how you want to get the book. But I am so excited to get started with you. And also, I'm not going to spoil it, but we have some really exciting guests who will be joining us on Quarantini in April, especially along the lines of how do we create change? How do we change minds and combat homophobia in a very scary time? So don't forget to find all of your options to get the book, to get under the rainbow at quarantini.lgbt. Now let's get back to Giovanni's room, part two, chapter four. First, as always, a bit of a recap. So at last in this chapter, the very beginning, David's girlfriend, Hella, returns to Paris. We finally meet her. And surprisingly, nothing really seems to have changed in the relationship. David actually feels glad to see her. She admits that she hasn't really been nice to David, uh, just leaving him in Paris. And eventually, they go to bed together. And he writes to his father and says that he, David, intends to marry her. So maybe everything that happened with Giovanni didn't really matter. But after three days, Giovanni and Hella actually meet by accident. And it happens while Hella is talking about the difficulty of womanhood. And David is, once again, being a bit of a misogynist. So they meet at this bookstore. And there, David runs into Jacques, uh, the rich gay American, who calls him out for abandoning Giovanni. And Giovanni, we learn, thought that David had drowned himself because he had just completely disappeared without any warning. And Giovanni, who was actually out of the bookshop trying to call David, trying to find him, eventually comes back to the shop and demands to know where David has been. And he's extremely upset. David's never seen him like this before. And David introduces Giovanni to Hella. And Jacques suggests they go for a drink. But Hella doesn't feel so well and they leave. And David explains to Hella that Giovanni is just his roommate. And he explains that Giovanni actually has a mistress. They're nothing more than roommates. And Hella keeps asking questions about Giovanni. And surprisingly, when this happens, David actually admits that he loves him in a way. And she suggests, you know, she's very amicable. She suggests they take him out to dinner. But David agrees and begs that they leave Paris as soon as his father's money arrives. He just has to get out of Giovanni's room. And the next night, David eventually returns to Giovanni's room. He's very drunk. He wakes up Giovanni uh, while he's sleeping. Giovanni sees him and starts crying. And he calls David evil. He says David hasn't lied, but he certainly hasn't told him the truth. And David says nothing. He feels only terror and pity and a rising lust. And Giovanni tells him about his village, his background back in Italy, which apparently he had never done before. He says that he used to actually be with a woman who gave birth to a stillborn child. Giovanni admits he actually spit on a crucifix on a cross in rage and then left Italy for Paris after this happened. And David, while Giovanni is going on and on, feels as if his heart is broken. And he says that he was always going to return back to Hella. Didn't Giovanni realize that? But Giovanni doesn't buy it. He says, you lie so much. You have come to believe all of your own lies, he said. You never have loved anyone. You love your purity. You love your mirror. David, he accuses him just wants to be clean. And above all, he says that he's immoral. 
David responds saying, well, he's a man. And he says, what do you think could happen between us as two men? And Giovanni says, you know very well what can happen between us. And for that reason, you are leaving me. And so a pretty dramatic moment. Uh, Eventually, after they have this long argument, they drink some cognac. And it's the last time when he leaves the next morning that David ever speaks to Giovanni. And somehow he doesn't cry at all. And David spends some more time with Hela, which is often melancholy. And sometimes he actually runs into Giovanni, who looks unwell and seems to be acting more and more like Jacques. Then David starts seeing Giovanni with the street boys. And the chapter ends with the news that Giovanni is about to get his job in the bar back after he was fired by Guillaume. And one week later, we learn that Guillaume will be found strangled with the sash of his dressing gown. And the chapter with that cliffhanger ends. And so our discussion question was, how does Hella in person compared to the Hella described earlier in absence? And Gary B emailed in to say, it's not Hella, but their hollow relationship that comes into focus here. Neither one of them sees the other as their soulmate. Each perceives the other as more of a convenient accommodation, a means of satisfying the conventions of society. And he adds, if there's a revision in this chapter, and I completely agree with this, it isn't in our view of Hella, but actually in our understanding of what connects the couple. It's a fear they share, one of not finding more in a willingness to accept a partial approximation of what they want in life, simply in order to secure a safe place in society. And I absolutely agree with what Gary is saying. Maybe David feels love for Hella, but he feels compelled to love her by a society that tells him he has absolutely no other option. And because of this, he ends up abandoning Giovanni, which is, in this book, the ultimate tragedy. And one thing that I noticed is that I, as a reader, when I was rereading this, I felt like I was rooting for Hela to be a mean-spirited character, for her to come back and be a foil to Giovanni. And I wanted a reason to dislike her, to give David more of an excuse to leave her or to continue lying to her. But in this chapter, as we find out and as we actually meet Hela, she's absolutely charming. She's kind and thoughtful and enlightened. So Baldwin very explicitly is not giving David or us any excuses. He's highlighting how the internal struggle within David, the lies that he's telling to others and to himself come with collateral damage. By refusing to accept real love, even if that love is forbidden, he's hurting everyone, including himself and including Hela. So... Our assignment for today is the last chapter in this book, Giovanni's Room, Part 2, Chapter 5. And I know this last chapter was a bit long, so I'm giving you the entire weekend to finish the book as its whole. So if you're behind, all the videos are up on quarantini.lgbt. You can follow along and go at your own pace. Our discussion question for this last chapter is, what is the greatest lesson to be learned from Giovanni's room. So we will discuss the very last chapter on Monday. So feel free to send in your responses to me at quarantini at ericservini.com over the weekend. And tomorrow I will be live once again at 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific with a bonus assignment for the weekend. If you're already ahead uh, or you just have a lot of free time. So Of course, don't forget to visit quarantini.lgbt to order our April book selection, which is Under the Rainbow by Celia Lasky. I am so excited to read it with you all. I'm Dr. Eric Cervini, and I will see you tomorrow on Quarantini.